Two Black Bottles by Wilfred Blanche Talman with H.P. Lovecraft. Not all of the few remaining inhabitants of Dolbergen, that dismal little village in the Ramapo Mountains, believe that my uncle, old Domini Vanderhoof, is really dead. Some of them believe he is suspended somewhere between heaven and hell because of the old sexton's curse. If it had not been for that old magician, he might still be preaching in the little damp church across the moor. After what has happened to me in Dolbergen, I can almost share the opinion of the villagers. I am not sure that my uncle is dead, but I am very sure that he is not alive upon this earth. There is no doubt that the old sexton buried him once, but he is not in that grave now. I can almost feel him behind me as I write, impelling me to tell the truth about those strange happenings in Dolbergen so many years ago. It was the fourth day of October when I arrived at Dolbergen in answer to a summons. The letter was from a former member of my uncle's congregation, who wrote that the old man had passed away, and that there should be some small estate which I, as his only living relative, might inherit. Having reached the secluded little hamlet by a wearying series of changes on branch railways, I found my way to the grocery store of Mark Haynes, writer of the letter, and he, leading me into a stuffy back room, told me a peculiar tale concerning Domini Vanderhoof's death. You should be careful, Hoffman, Haynes told me. When you meet that old sexton Abel Foster, he's in league with the devil, sure's you're alive. Twan T. two weeks ago Sam Pryor, when he passed the old graveyard, heard him mumbling to the dead there. Twan T. right he should talk that way, and Sam does vow that there was a voice answered him, a kinder of half voice, hollow and muffled like, as though it come out o' the ground. There's others too, as could tell you about seeing him standin' afore old Domini Slot's grave, that one right again the church wall, a ring in his hands and a talking to the moss on the tombstone as though it was the old Domini himself. Old Foster, Haynes said, had come to Dolbergen about ten years before and had been immediately engaged by Vanderhoof to take care of the damp stone church at which most of the villagers worshipped. No one but Vanderhoof seemed to like him, for his presence brought a suggestion almost of the uncanny. He would sometimes stand by the door when the people came to church, and the men would coldly return his servile bow while the women brushed past in haste, holding their skirts aside to avoid touching him. They could be seen on weekdays cutting the grass in the cemetery and tending the flowers around the graves, now and then crooning and muttering to himself, and few failed to notice the particular attention he paid to the grave of the Reverend Gilliam Slot, first pastor of the church in 1701. It was not long after Foster's establishment as a village fixture that disaster began to lower. First came the failure of the mountain mine where most of the men worked. The vein of iron had given out, and many of the people moved away to better localities, while those who had large holdings of land in the vicinity took to farming and managed to wrest a meagre living from the rocky hillsides. Then came the disturbances in the church. It was whispered about that the Reverend Johannes Vanderhoof had made a compact with the devil, and was preaching his word in the house of God. His sermons had become weird and grotesque redolent with sinister things which the ignorant people of Dolbergen did not understand. He transported them back over ages of fear and superstition to regions of hideous, unseen spirits, and peopled their fancy with night-haunting ghouls. One by one the congregation dwindled, while the elders and deacons vainly pleaded with Vanderhoof to change the subject of his sermons. Though the old man continually promised to comply, he seemed to be enthralled by some higher power which forced him to do its will. A giant in stature, Johannes Vanderhoof was known to be weak and timid at heart, yet even when threatened with expulsion he continued his eerie sermons, until scarcely a handful of people remained to listen to him on Sunday morning. Because of weak finances, it was found impossible to call a new pastor, and before long not one of the villages dared venture near the church or the parsonage which adjoined it. Everywhere there was fear of those spectral wraiths with whom Vanderhoof was apparently in league. My uncle, Mark Haynes, told me, had continued to live in the parsonage because there was no one with sufficient courage to tell him to move out of it. No one ever saw him again, but lights were visible in the parsonage at night, and were even glimpsed in the church from time to time. It was whispered about the town that Vanderhoof preached regularly in the church every Sunday morning unaware that his congregation was no longer there to listen. He had only the old sexton, who lived in the basement of the church, to take care of him, and Foster made a weekly visit to what remained of the business section of the village to buy provisions. 
He no longer bowed servilely to everyone he met, but instead seemed to harbour a demoniac and ill-concealed hatred. He spoke to no one except as was necessary to make his purchases, and glanced from left to right out of evil-filled eyes as he walked the street with his cane tapping the uneven pavements. Bent and shriveled with extreme age, his presence could actually be felt by anyone near him, so powerful was that personality which, said the townspeople, had made Vanderhoof accept the devil as his master. No person in Dolbergen doubted that Abel Foster was at the bottom of all the town's ill luck, but not a one dared lift a finger against him, or could even approach him without a tremor of fear. His name, as well as Vanderhoof's, was never mentioned aloud. Whenever the matter of the church across the moor was discussed, it was in whispers, and if the conversation chanced to be nocturnal, the whisperers would keep glancing over their shoulders to make sure that nothing shapeless or sinister crept out of the darkness to bear witness to their words. The churchyard continued to be kept just as green and beautiful as when the church was in use, and the flowers near the graves in the cemetery were tended just as carefully as in times gone by. The old sexton could occasionally be seen working there, as if still being paid for his services, and those who dared venture near said that he maintained a continual conversation with the devil and with those spirits which lurked within the graveyard walls. One morning, Haynes went on to say, Foster was seen digging a grave where the steeple of the church throws its shadow in the afternoon, before the sun goes down behind the mountain and puts the entire village in semi-twilight. Later, the church bell, silent for months, tolled solemnly for a half hour, and at sundown those who were watching from a distance saw Foster bring a coffin from the parsonage on a wheelbarrow, dump it into the grave with slender ceremony, and replace the earth in the hole. The sexton came to the village the next morning, ahead of his usual weekly schedule, and in much better spirits than was customary. He seemed willing to talk, remarking that Vanderhoof had died the day before, and that he had buried his body beside that of Domini Slop near the church wall. He smiled from time to time, and rubbed his hands in an untimely and unaccountable glee. It was apparent that he took a perverse and diabolic delight in Vanderhoof's death. The villagers were conscious of an added uncanniness in his presence, and avoided him as much as they could. With Vanderhoof gone, they felt more insecure than ever, for the old sexton was now free to cast his worst spells over the town from the church across the moor. Muttering something in a tongue which no one understood, Foster made his way back along the road over the swamp. It was then, it seems, that Mark Haynes remembered having heard Domini Vanderhoof speak of me as his nephew. Haynes accordingly sent for me, in the hope that I might know something which would clear up the mystery of my uncle's last years. I assured my summoner, however, that I knew nothing about my uncle or his past, except that my mother had mentioned him as a man of gigantic physique, but with little courage or power of will. Having heard all that Haynes had to tell me, I lowered the front legs of my chair to the floor and looked at my watch. It was late afternoon. How far is it out to the church? I inquired. Think I can make it before sunset? Sure, lad, you ain't going out there tonight, not to that place. The old man trembled noticeably in every limb and half rose from his chair, stretching out a lean, detaining hand. Why, it's plum foolishness, he exclaimed. I laughed aside his fears and informed him that, come what may, I was determined to see the old sexton that evening and get the whole matter over as soon as possible. I did not intend to accept the superstitions of ignorant country folk as truth, for I was convinced that all I had just heard was merely a chain of events which the over-imaginative people of Dolbergen had happened to link with their ill luck. I felt no sense of fear or horror whatever. Seeing that I was determined to reach my uncle's house before nightfall, Haynes ushered me out of his office and reluctantly gave me the few required directions, pleading from time to time that I change my mind. He shook my hand when I left, as though he never expected to see me again. Take care that old devil Foster don't get ye, he warned again and again. I wouldn't go near him after dark fur love enna money. No siree. He re-entered his store, solemnly shaking his head, while I set out along a road leading to the outskirts of the town. I had walked barely two minutes before I sighted the moor of which Haynes had spoken. The road, flanked by a whitewashed fence, passed over the great swamp, which was overgrown with clumps of underbrush dipping down into the dank, slimy ooze. An odour of deadness and decay filled the air, and even in the sunlit afternoon little wisps of vapour could be seen rising from the unhealthful spot. 
On the opposite side of the moor, I turned sharply to the left, as I had been directed, branching from the main road. There were several houses in the vicinity, I noticed. Houses which were scarcely more than huts, reflecting the extreme poverty of their owners. The road here passed under the drooping branches of enormous willows, which almost completely shut out the rays of the sun. The miasmal odour of the swamp was still in my nostrils, and the air was damp and chilly. I hurried my pace to get out of that dismal tunnel as soon as possible. Presently I found myself in the light again. The sun, now hanging like a red ball upon the crest of the mountain, was beginning to dip low, and there, some distance ahead of me, bathed in its bloody iridescence, stood the lonely church. I began to sense that uncanniness which Haynes had mentioned that feeling of dread which made all Dolbergen shun the place. The squat, stone hulk of the church itself, with its blunt steeple, seemed like an idol to which the tombstones that surrounded it bowed down and worshipped, each with an arched top like the shoulders of a kneeling person, while over the whole assemblage the dingy, grey parsonage hovered like a wraith. I had slowed my pace a trifle as I took in the scene. The sun was disappearing behind the mountain very rapidly now, and the damp air chilled me. Turning my coat collar up about my neck, I plodded on. Something caught my eye as I glanced up again. In the shadow of the church wall was something white, a thing which seemed to have no definite shape. Straining my eyes as I came nearer, I saw that it was a cross of new timber, surmounting a mound of freshly turned earth. The discovery sent a new chill through me. I realised that this must be my uncle's grave, but something told me that it was not like the other graves near it. It did not seem like a dead grave. In some intangible way it appeared to be living, if a grave can be said to live. Very close to it, I saw as I came nearer, was another grave. An old mound with a crumbling stone about it. To many slots too, I thought, remembering Haynes's story. There was no sign of life anywhere about the place. In the semi-twilight I climbed the low knoll upon which the parsonage stood, and hammered upon the door. There was no answer. I skirted the house and peered into the windows. The whole place seemed deserted. The lowering mountains had made night fall with disarming suddenness, the minute the sun was fully hidden. I realised that I could see scarcely more than a few feet ahead of me. Feeling my way carefully, I rounded a corner of the house and paused, wondering what to do next. Everything was quiet. There was not a breath of wind nor were there even the usual noises made by animals in their nocturnal ramblings. All dread had been forgotten for a time, but in the presence of that sepulchral calm my apprehensions returned. I imagined the air peopled with ghastly spirits that pressed around me, making the air almost unbreathable. I wondered for the hundredth time where the old sexton might be. As I stood there, half expecting some sinister demon to creep from the shadows, I noticed two lighted windows glaring from the belfry of the church. I then remembered what Haynes had told me about Foster's living in the basement of the building. Advancing cautiously through the blackness, I found a side door of the church ajar. The interior had a musty and mildewed odour. Everything I touched was covered with a cold, clammy moisture. I struck a match and began to explore to discover, if I could, how to get into the belfry. Suddenly I stopped in my tracks. A snatch of song, loud and obscene, sung in a voice that was guttural and thick with drink, came from above me. The match burned my fingers and I dropped it. Two pinpoints of light pierced the darkness of the farther wall of the church, and below them, to one side, I could see a door outlined where light filtered through its cracks. The song stopped as abruptly as it had commenced, and there was absolute silence again. My heart was thumping and blood racing through my temples. Had I not been petrified with fear, I should have fled immediately. Not caring to light another match, I felt my way among the pews until I stood in front of the door. So deep was the feeling of depression which had come over me that I felt as though I were acting in a dream. My actions were almost involuntary. The door was locked, as I found when I turned the knob. I hammered upon it for some time, but there was no answer. The silence was as complete as before. Feeling around the edge of the door, I found the hinges, removed the pins from them, and allowed the door to fall toward me. Dim light flooded down a steep flight of steps. There was a sickening odour of whisky. I could now hear someone stirring in the belfry room above. Venturing a low halloo, I thought I heard a groan in reply, and cautiously climbed the stairs. 
My first glance into that unhallowed place was indeed startling. Strewn about the little room were old and dusty books and manuscripts, strange things that bespoke almost unbelievable age. On rows of shelves which reached to the ceiling were horrible things in glass jars and bottles, snakes and lizards and bats. Dust and mould and cobwebs encrusted everything. In the centre, behind a table upon which was a lighted candle, a nearly empty bottle of whisky, and a glass, was a motionless figure with a thin, scrawny, wrinkled face and wild eyes that stared blankly through me. I recognised Abel Foster, the old sexton, in an instant. He did not move or speak as I came slowly and fearfully toward him. Mr Foster, I asked, trembling with unaccountable fear when I heard my voice echo within the close confines of the room. There was no reply, and no movement from the figure behind the table. I wondered if he had not drunk himself to insensibility, and went behind the table to shake him. At the mere touch of my arm upon his shoulder, the strange old man started from his chair as though terrified. His eyes, still having in them that same blank stare, were fixed upon me. Swinging his arms like flails, he backed away. Don't, he screamed. Don't touch me. Go back, go back. I saw that he was both drunk and struck with some kind of a nameless terror. Using a soothing tone, I told him who I was and why I had come. He seemed to understand vaguely and sank back into his chair, sitting limp and motionless. I thought you was him, he mumbled. I thought you was him come back for it. He's been a trine, to get out, a trine, to get out since I put him in there. His voice again rose to a scream and he clutched his chair. Maybe he's got out now, maybe he's out. I looked about, half expecting to see some spectral shape coming up the stairs. Maybe who's out, I inquired. Vanderhoof, he shrieked. The cross over his grave keeps falling down in the night. Every morning the earth is loose and gets harder to pat down. He'll come out and I won't be able to do nothing. Forcing him back into the chair, I seated myself on a box near him. He was trembling in mortal terror, with the saliva dripping from the corners of his mouth. From time to time I felt that sense of horror which Haynes had described when he told me of the old sexton. Truly, there was something uncanny about the man. His head had now sunk forward upon his breast, and he seemed calmer, mumbling to himself. I quietly arose and opened a window to let out the fumes of whiskey and the musty odour of dead things. Light from a dim moon, just risen, made objects below barely visible. I could just see Domini van der Hoof's grave from my position in the belfry, and blinked my eyes as I gazed at it. That cross was tilted. I remembered that it had been vertical an hour ago. Fear took possession of me again. I turned quickly. Foster sat in his chair watching me. His glance was saner than before. So ye van der Hoof's nephew, he mumbled in a nasal tone. Well, ye might well know it all. He'll be back arter me afore long, he will, just, as soon as he can get out o' that their grave. Ye might well know all about it now. His terror appeared to have left him. He seemed resigned to some horrible fate which he expected any minute. His head dropped down upon his chest again, and he went on muttering in that nasal monotone. Ye see all them their books and papers. Well, there was once Domini Slots, Domini Slot, who was here years ago. All them things is got to do with magic. Black magic that the old Domini knew afore he come to this country. They used to burn em and boil em in oil fur knowing that over there they did. But old Slot knew, and he didn't go fur to tell nobody. No sir, old Slot used to preach here generations ago, and he used to come up here and study them books, and use all them dead things in jars and pronounce magic curses and things, but he didn't let nobody know it. No, nobody knowed it but Domini Slot and me. You, I ejaculated, leaning across the table toward him. That is, me after I learned it. His face showed lines of trickery as he answered me. I found all this stuff here when I come to be church sexton, and I used to read it when I wasn't at work, and I soon got to know all about it. The old man droned on while I listened spellbound. He told about learning the difficult formulae of demonology, so that, by means of incantations, he could cast spells over human beings. He had performed horrible occult rites of his hellish creed, calling down anathema upon the town and its inhabitants. Crazed by his desires, he tried to bring the church under his spell, but the power of God was too strong. 
Finding Johannes van der Hoof very weak-willed, he bewitched him so that he preached strange and mystic sermons which struck fear into the simple hearts of the country folk. From his position in the belfry room, he said, behind a painting of the temptation of Christ which adorned the rear wall of the church, he would glare at van der Hoof while he was preaching, through holes which were the eyes of the devil in the picture. Terrified by the uncanny things which were happening in their midst, the congregation left one by one, and Foster was able to do what he pleased with the church and with van der Hoof. But what did you do with him? I asked in a hollow voice as the old sexton paused in his confession. He burst into a cackle of laughter, throwing back his head in drunken glee. I took his soul, he howled in a tone that set me trembling. I took his soul and put it in a bottle, in a little black bottle, and I buried him. But he ain't got his soul, and he can't go neither to heaven nor hell, but he's a coming back after it. He's a trying to get out o oh, his grave now. I can hear him pushing his way up through the ground. He's that strong. As the old man had proceeded with his story, I had become more and more convinced that he must be telling me the truth and not merely gibbering in drunkenness. Every detail fitted what Haynes had told me. Fear was growing upon me by degrees. With the old wizard now shouting with demoniac laughter, I was tempted to bolt down the narrow stairway and leave that accursed neighbourhood. To calm myself, I rose and again looked out of the window. My eyes nearly started from their sockets when I saw that the cross above van der Hoof's grave had fallen perceptibly since I had last looked at it. It was now tilted to an angle of forty-five degrees. Can't we dig up van der Hoof and restore his soul? I asked almost breathlessly, feeling that something must be done in a hurry. The old man rose from his chair in terror. No, 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 he screamed. He'd kill me. I forget the formula. And if he gets out, he'll be alive without a soul. He'd kill us both. Where is the bottle that contains his soul? I asked, advancing threateningly toward him. I felt that some ghastly thing was about to happen, which I must do all in my power to prevent. I won't tell ye, young whelp, he snarled. I felt, rather than saw, a queer light in his eyes as he backed into a corner. And don't ye touch me either, or ye'll wish ye hadn't. I moved a step forward, noticing that on a low stool behind him there were two black bottles. Foster muttered some peculiar words in a low sing-song voice. Everything began to turn grey before my eyes, and something within me seemed to be dragged upward, trying to get out at my throat. I felt my knees become weak. Lurching forward, I caught the old sexton by the throat, and with my free arm reached for the bottles on the stool. But the old man fell backward, striking the stool with his foot, and one bottle fell to the floor as I snatched the other. There was a flash of blue flame, and a sulphurous smell filled the room. From the little heap of broken glass a white vapour rose and followed the draught out the window. Curse ye, ye rascal, sounded a voice that seemed faint and far away. Foster, whom I had released when the bottle broke, was crouching against the wall, looking smaller and more shriveled than before. His face was slowly turning greenish-black. Curse ye, said the voice again, hardly sounding as though it came from his lips. I'm done fur, that one in there was mine. Domini Slot took it out two hundred years ago. He slid slowly toward the floor, gazing at me with hatred in eyes that were rapidly dimming. His flesh changed from white to black, and then to yellow. I saw with horror that his body seemed to be crumbling away and his clothing falling into limp folds. The bottle in my hand was growing warm. I glanced at it fearfully. It glowed with a faint phosphorescence. Stiff with fright, I set it upon the table but could not keep my eyes from it. There was an ominous moment of silence as its glow became brighter, and then there came distinctly to my ears the sound of sliding earth. Gasping for breath, I looked out of the window. The moon was now well up in the sky, and by its light I could see that the fresh cross above van der Hoof's grave had completely fallen. Once again there came the sound of trickling gravel, and no longer able to control myself, I stumbled down the stairs and found my way out of doors. Falling now and then as I raced over the uneven ground, I ran on in abject terror. When I had reached the foot of the knoll, at the entrance to that gloomy tunnel beneath the willows, I heard a horrible roar behind me. Turning, I glanced back toward the church. Its wall reflected the light of the moon, 
and silhouetted against it was a gigantic, loathsome, black shadow climbing from my uncle's grave and floundering gruesomely toward the church. I told my story to a group of villagers in Haynes's stall the next morning. They looked from one to the other with little smiles during my tale, I noticed, but when I suggested that they accompany me to the spot, gave various excuses for not caring to go. Though there seemed to be a limit to their credulity, they cared to run no risks. I informed them that I would go alone, though I must confess that the project did not appeal to me. As I left the store, one old man with a long, white beard hurried after me and caught my arm. I'll go why ye, lad, he said. It do seem that I once heard my grandpap tell o something o the sort concerning old Dominie Slot. A queer old man I've heard he were, but Vanderhoof's been worse. Dominie Vanderhoof's grave was open and deserted when we arrived. Of course it could have been grave robbers, the two of us agreed, and yet. In the belfry the bottle which I had left upon the table was gone, though the fragments of the broken one were found on the floor, and upon the heap of yellow dust and crumpled clothing that had once been Abel Foster were certain immense footprints. After glancing at some of the books and papers strewn about the belfry room, we carried them down the stairs and burned them as something unclean and unholy. With a spade which we found in the church basement, we filled in the grave of Johannes Vanderhoof, and as an afterthought, flung the fallen cross upon the flames. Old wives say that now, when the moon is full, there walks about the churchyard a gigantic and bewildered figure clutching a bottle and seeking some unremembered goal.